slightly delayed episode of the Fertility Podcast. I'm Natalie, your host. If you haven't listened to the Fertility Podcast before, do visit thefertilitypodcast.com or have a look back in your podcast app if that's how you've got here because there's over 180 episodes. If you are listening in a podcast app, do rate and review it, this podcast I mean, because it helps keep the excitement bubbling around it. It also helps other people find it. And be sure to follow me on my socials, which are at Fertility Poddy on Insta and Twitter. The Fertility Podcast has a page on facebook and it's always amazing to hear from you so you can email me natalie at the fertilitypodcast.com so what's this episode all about well it's a live recording from an event that a fab group i'm part of called talk fertility held last week in manchester and we had a panel of experts talking about issues affecting men's fertility it was called men matter too and we had it as a webinar which is why i've got the recording for you i must say the quality isn't as amazing as i'd like it to be but we'll work on that i know i've said things like that quite often lately but it's because I'm trying to share audio with you from all different things that are going on in my world and um, remember this podcast is a social enterprise so the money behind it is still limited hence the resources for us to record are limited but who knows hopefully all that will change let me tell you about the panel of experts you're going to be hearing from because we had Rosie Tadman who is a nutritional therapist specializing in helping couples with their fertility We had Dr. Mohamed Akhtar, who's a consultant gynecologist and fertility specialist, especially with male fertility. And he works at Manchester Fertility and St. Mary's here in Manchester. Dr. Michael Carroll, who's a senior lecturer in reproductive science at Manchester Metropolitan University. And he also educates embryologists. And he's done a lot of research investigating lifestyle and environmental effects on sperm health. We had Dr. Robin Hadley, who is a researcher looking at the effects of men living childless he also shares a lot about his own experience and he's the founding member of aging without children and if perchance you read the sunday times magazine yesterday i'm talking to you at the 17th of june 2019 uh, dr robin hadley featured prominently in the article which was amazing to see and last but not least is jack Broadly, Jack is the founder of Baggy Trousers UK. He survived testicular cancer and set up the charity to help raise awareness for men in how to uh, look after themselves and where to find support. It was a really interesting panel discussion. Like I said, we made it a webinar as well because we want to try and get all our content as far reaching as possible. Before I share that with you though, a few other things I want to just tell you that's been going on in the fertility podcast world because today, Monday the 17th of June, sees the launch of a brand new radio show that I'm a part of. I'm co-hosting Talk Fertility, the radio show on ukhealthradio.com, which is an internet radio station with a whole host of kind of health related content. And I'm presenting it with Kate Davis, who has been a guest on this podcast in the past. She's a fertility nurse consultant and works daily with women trying to conceive and has just such a wealth of knowledge as well as a brilliant contact book and the pair of us have been combining our contact books to make this a radio show so I will be sharing bits and bobs of our chats in fact the first one that we've shared today is a conversation with Rosie who you're going to be hearing on this panel so it leads me quite nicely onto the panel before we start that though here's a note from my sponsors who make this podcast possible This podcast is sponsored by International Andrology, who specialise in diagnosing and treating male infertility. Around 50% of infertility issues are male factor, and all too often, men aren't even evaluated at the start of a fertility journey, which might result in unnecessary treatments, costs, and disappointment. International Andrology is one of the few specialist clinics in the UK, offering a holistic approach to increase your chances to conceive naturally or via the IVF route. As well as treating the underlying causes of male infertility, their doctors have some of the highest success rates in microsurgical sperm retrieval. So, if you're looking for a true specialist to assist you on your fertility journey, visit london-andrology.co.uk today and do mention the Fertility Podcast. So we're going to join our panel discussion and first up you're going to hear from Rosie Tadman. I'd asked her to talk about things that were detrimental to sperm health with regards to your diet. Then you'll hear Dr. Michael Carroll, then Dr. Mohamed Akhtar, then Dr. Robin Hadley and then Jack Broadley. So hopefully you'll work out whose voice is who along the way. So things that can negatively impact your sperm, first of all in terms of diet and lifestyle, 
let's start with the obvious ones that people often you will even the nhs would talk about that's things like smoking that's things like alcohol that's things um like recreational drugs then the kind of less known ones probably more lack of nutrients um is absolutely huge impact negative impact to sperm the beige the kind of beige brigade is not great for sperm health the things that are absolutely brilliant uh eating the rainbow in terms of your vegetables it might not sound revolutionary but that is absolutely fantastic making sure you're getting a good mix of proteins fats carbohydrates very basic but i won't hog the mic yeah i mean to add to that um eating too much isn't isn't a good idea either so there's a link between obesity and a decrease in sperm quality um, and that can alter the, the, the hormones that regulate sperm production. Um, you mentioned smoking. Smoking is bad all around. Doesn't look good, doesn't smell good, damages everything. Um, and there's a clear link association between smoking and um, DNA damage in sperm um, and an increase in infertility. Alcohol is a diff difficult one because some studies suggest that um, there is no difference between drinking alcohol, moderately of course, and, um, and sperm quality. Um, some suggest that even if you drink a little bit, um, that can improve sperm quality. What that tells us all is that we need lots of research to actually really pan this out. Um, what I would say is that drinking lots of alcohol is no good either for, for all aspects of health. Um, other um, lifestyle exposures. I mean, one of the things that has come recently is a, is a study stu um, which came out in 2017 hit the headlines all around the world showing that 60% or there's a 60% decrease in sperm count in, in men. Um, and this was rev not revolutionary, but it, um, it was known for some time, about 20 years before that, that there is a decline in sperm count. The headlines were, were a bit um, alarmist, saying that this is the end of humankind. I think the current geopolitical situation might be the end of humankind. Um, and climate change, of course, more pressing issues. <clears throat> It did point out that there is a change in, in um, the production of cells and the amount of cells that, that men are producing. What the question is, what is that? What's causing this decline, not just in sperm count, but in other aspects of um, male um, reproductive health? That um, it would include uh, the endocrinology, the hormone part of, uh, of controlling um, male fertility. And that's something that I'm sure we'll speak about through the, through the course of the evening. Thank you. Now, is alluded now one of the things which for uh, nutritional diet what I have seen in clinical practice when a gentleman has come with low sperm count or any issues so immediately the gentleman not only changes his diet significantly whatever the diet may be and also taking a lot of multivitamins and whatever you can grab and grasp so interestingly you can actually overdose yourself with all this nutritional, so not every vitamin is, you know, soluble, is water soluble. Most of them you can overdose for vitamin A. So one of the things I think, if you are going to change something, I think lifestyle is more important than actually going to a multivitamins to begin with. Because once you've done that, then you maybe can do uh, change the other part. Secondly, recreational drugs. Yes, we, in our geopolitical story, it's very easy to say that we've been using it all across. It has a detrimental effect. Professor Ellen Pacey, you've just seen, he done a study called CHAPS UK, which showed that cannabis has a very negative impact even whenever used. And maybe there's a number of cells required or less. And the last thing, which again, we are using more and more, we're going to come to it in protein shakes in more detail. And again, that is a change in the way we eat things and we use our nutrition interestingly we have not a lot of ethnic population currently sitting in our here hopefully in webinar they will be attending so diet patterns are very different we've been doing a study in man in st mary's manchester looking at diet patterns the diet patterns of each ethnic population is very diverse and has different nutrients and maybe we need to target it on an individual basis rather than a generic story. I think the only thing that I can add as a, as a, as a cancer survivor would be, um, so I've, I've, I have a diagnosis called hypogonadism, um, and that stems from previous to my treatment, um, the production of sperm stopped, and that was because of 
I was a heavy gym user. Um, I thought I was eating the right foods. I'm just kind of echoing what these guys are saying, really. Um, I'm an example of that. Next up, we spoke about protein shakes, something that's been talked about in the press about how men are trying to make themselves look amazing, but at what cost to their fertility? And here's Dr. Mohammed Akhtar's response. I think protein shakes is a very interesting phenomena in that way because there are, in a generic way, there are three kinds of protein shakes, pre-workout, post-workout, during workout. And all of them has very different ingredients. And because the amount and availability of different kinds of protein shakes are so vast it's it's very difficult to pinpoint what exactly in that protein shake is causing it so i've done a lot of thinking and reading about it and what i have gathered uh, in a very simplistic way is there's a high amount of caffeine or nicotine is in the pre-workout protein shake so it actually gives you more of nicotine or caffeine so you can work another two miles you can run another two miles in the pro Post-workout protein shakes, there's a lot of amount of cretane, which is to make sure that your muscle has, you know, uh, got its hypoxia. And I don't know the amount. I don't know. Each one is different. In the protein shake, which we take during the workout, actually, I think, has got inwardly some kind of anabolic steroid. Because otherwise, science doesn't make sense that when we eat something, a protein, it takes about a couple of hours to come out of our stomach to be absorbed. So how does a protein shake works that quickly to give that impact that drastically? So at that time, so the only thing we can, I think of this is that pre-workout is increased amount of nicotine or caffeine. So on average, it's about one spoon of pre-workout protein shake contains about 200 to 300 milligrams of caffeine. The ad adult dose for a 70 kilo man is 180 milligrams. That's about six cups of coffee a day. So that's suddenly, and that has a detrimental effect on sperm because they might move fast, but they might not work. The cretane, we do not know. It's been shown as it's been effective, but we do not know the amount of dosage because all these medications are adequately medicated medications and has to be have a dose relationship. So if it takes a cer certain amount of dose to take your blood pressure medication, you can overdose it. So similar amount on the protein shakes, and at the minute, it has, has to be regulated so one of the things which I think from this we should have to look at is like, like an e-cigarette should be taken as a medicated medication, same as protein shake. This has to be regulated by the authorities, has to show what is on the ingredient, what it contains exactly, because lots of protein shakes have got E, P, T, whatever substances, and we do not know what those are. And that's what I think people could relate to, that they are anabolic steroids. And in my clinical practice, I have seen a significant increase in the uh, quality, poor quality sperm. So when I joined as a consultant about five years ago nearly now, that the number of referrals were few and far between, not as many. It's now quadrupled in the last five years. Remember, this is only one unit in an NHS, and same as outside. And this all mostly lifestyle modification which is required for most men but they don't realize at that time it takes about three months two to three months to make a sperm so the change is quite takes a long time and then your partner is on your back say come on do something right now and it's like very okay i'm waiting for three months and then he says okay then those three months are quite challenging could be up to six to twelve months and what Jack has talked about hypogonadism. That is the prime example of taking steroids, not for him particularly, but you know, but it could be that you take steroids and causes that your brain gland in your brain pituitary to fail not to produce the hormones. And that can then have a detrimental effect long term as well as short term. And all this is for from my perspective, or I think all of I think the awareness what Dr. Fertility, Natalie and all this very important because we men are not aware of this we are going to a dangerous world already we are not aware we think at the age of 21 it's not going to happen to me because it never happens i'll be all okay but that's and this is where we are at this moment of time and i think we need to be even more aware and maybe we need to assess and last thing i'm going to go back i'm going to say that one last thing from and then so is that when 
men produce or ejaculate. They think semen contains sperm. That is the fundamental, I think, misconception. Okay, semen contains basically fluid from seminal vesicle. That's why it's called semen, prostatic fluid, and sperm. And sperm constitute a very small amount of it, actually. So just by having a semen doesn't mean there is sperm. So I think that's where we get it wrong. Women kindly understand that they don't have a period, they're not ovulating. So they are much more aware than what we are. And that's one of the things which we need to let inform uh, public to that we just contact and come early rather than late. Okay, so we're now going to have our first question from the webinar that was running alongside the panel, which was about whether cycling has a detrimental effect on fertility. And Dr. Michael Carroll responds. Again, there are <clears throat> studies suggesting that cycling, long, uh, prolonged cycling can. It, put pressures, it puts pressure on this, those tiny little saddles that are about that width. They put pressure on the, um, on the pudendal nerve, which is important for um, sexual function. Um, the other thing is that it's the, the shorts to wear, the, the friction, the increase in testicular um, or scrotal temperature, taking all of detrimental effects on the production of sperm and the quality of sperm. So yeah, there is a link, clear link, between cycling, prolonged cycling, not just commuting in and out to work, um, but you know you, these road cyclists that, um, that are really banging at it, yeah, there is a link on the bike. When we look at a lot of these studies, we see links, we see associations. What we don't see very clearly are causations. And that, that's, so when, when you see a correlation or an association, that doesn't necessarily, it's cause and, and that's where we need to do more research. When we look at exercise, um, there are different types of exercises. You can high intensity or your prolonged, uh, like a, a long duration exercise like cycling or marathon running. Again, what this does is put stress on the body. It increases uh, stress hormones. And when you have increased stress hormones, that can impact on the hormones that are important for making sperm. So again, exercise moderately, and again, there are some studies have shown that um, very high intensity weightlifting can cause a decrease in sperm quality. Um, moderate exercise can increase sp sperm quality. So again, the message I think what we will get at the end of this is, is about moderation. And that includes about um, exercise. Just one other thing about the protein shakes is that um, when we find a, um, a decrease in sperm quality with the consumption of protein shakes, there are a lot of other confounding factors. So they're, they're in the gym, they're working out. They're high intensity working out. They're doing lots of other things. They're taking other, other supplements, not just protein shakes, um, to, to increase their, um, their performance in the gym. Um, so pulling out one of them may not be the, the answer. You have to really do a nice study, get someone on protein shakes for six months, see what happens, not exercising. Dr. Mohammed also gives his viewpoint. If you see the cyclist or cycle saddles in India, you'll be shocked, it's quite big unlike the Westerns, uh, you know. So in, or same as Africa, or even in, in, in Amsterdam, the saddles are quite big. So that's one of the things. Number two, the, the intensity, as Michael has alluded, is the key. Because when you're doing high intensity, you lose a lot of salt. So most of these high intensity cyclists then drink a lot of salt. You cannot imagine how much salt they, there's, I don't know if you see the high intensity games, they, use, they drink pickle juice, which is completely full of salt. So this amount of salt, that has a detrimental effect. Also, most of them, the high, you know, this I'm talking about elite here, they're on ketogenic diet. Okay, ketogenic diet, I have at least four patients uh, who are on, were on them and they have to stop and they can't exercise or they cannot actually attend any cycling event before three months before they can have the sperm banked and they go back to their normality. So, you know, and that is where we are. So it's not about, it's only not only intensity, it's what they're also having it to compensate as just uh, Michael alluded to it. Um, yeah, just in terms of salt. So I suppose salt as a nutritional therapy is one of the things that's often misunderstood. So it's table salt. That is a thing that is really detrimental to health in general. Table salt is pure sodium. If you're going to get a good quality rock salt or sea salt, you're going to have lots of other trace minerals in there as well. So magnesium, uh, manganese, boron, phosphorus, we need those. Um, so yeah, it's table salt to avoid. I asked Rosie to explain a bit more about 
where people can go with regards to their food if they are now looking at their gym routine and thinking they need to cut out the protein shakes how they can kind of improve their diet for exercising so in terms of your gym routine if you want to conceive I think it is that question of well what is your priority and I think that's a stark example of fitness and nutrition are not the same thing um, I know often people say to me well look at me you know I look, am- I look amazing you know my my fertility must be optimal I'm like but that doesn't mean the nutrients inside your body are optimal um, so it is a completely different thing fitness and nutrition um, and also if you do still there are good protein powders out there is what I'd also say that are so if you're going to kind of go to like your gym protein powder you look at the ingredients and it's like a thousand ingredients and loads of things that you can't even pronounce like they're the ones to avoid so brands which are quite nice which although I don't advocate a vegan diet for fertility because you can be lacking nutrients I do advocate a vegan protein powder just because you're not going to have the additional whey which comes with a whole host of whole raft of other issues so brands like Sun Warrior Vega protein, pure return are quite nice. Do you not think what you said from this salt, table salt, because that's quite interesting, because is it not the anti-kicking agent in the table salt, which is sodium ferrocyanide, which is probably more detrimental uh, to any, and then this anti-kicking agent is in all of our, sub, it's all on every food, which is actually preservative. So, because cyanide, in my opinion, is a poison. Okay, so if you take the, any other sea salt or Himalayan pink salt, okay, it doesn't contain that. Is that? I mean, anti caking agents are insane. Like they're, and I mean, they're in lots of the fertility supplements as well. So we know that I hate Pregnicare um, because they have the anti caking agents in them. Lots of kind of your cheap, I love naming and shaming. In my opinion, if you say that, is that fine? In my opinion other brands are available and caking agents in general they benefit the manufacturer it means that they stay on the shelf for a long and this is in, with supplements in general not just fertility supplements our liver has then got to metabolize them excrete them which if you're trying to conceive like or oh, if even if you're not your body's got enough to deal with um so actually going for better quality supplements and salt that don't have these anti-caking agents in there they are more expensive potentially, but that's also not to say that if they are expensive, they are good because there are some out there that are really expensive and they've still got anti-caking agents in them. Um, so yeah, going for good brands, yeah, anti-cake, yeah, excipients are scary. We are going to talk more about tests and other things to know, but I'd like to bring in Robin and Jack talking about this and what you need to be doing if you're actively trying to conceive is one thing, but if it's maybe not where you're at or maybe you've been trying and it's not been happening then that has to be a part of the dialogue as well that we're trying to encourage and Robin I'm going to bring you in just about that reluctance that men have to talk about this and how we can try and encourage the conversation and a bit more about your experience. Hi Um, my experience I was really broody in my mid-30s I was desperate to be a dad and I'm really uh, sad at times I didn't become a dad why didn't I become a dad? It wasn't particularly infertility, but it was timing of events, timing of getting into a relationship, timing of relationships ending, and also choice of partner. And all those factors come into not me not being a dad. And when I was in my mid-30s, I wouldn't be talking like I am now. I'd be holding it in. Absolutely. It's almost like there was a concrete block across here that would um, mean there's a big churning of emotion, but which I couldn't vocalize. I couldn't vocalize because I didn't have the capacity, but also who would I talk to? It wouldn't be my, my peers who seemed to be um, pulling kids out of cupboards at the time. And I was very jealous of them. So I was really stuck in not being able to talk, not knowing where to talk and feeling off track in that. Um, way we all I believe have the same emotional capacity when we're born and we're socialized differently between males and females and uh, boys and young men are socialized not to talk really but to act to be goal orientated outside themselves Uh, girls and women tend to be socialized to talk and share 
And so there's, this is uh, reversible, this not talking. You may have to learn how to do it and it may be going to a counselor or getting a trusted friend and, and picking who can do that. But it does help to take it outside yourself and to hear what you say back. And I can say that now, but when I was 35, I couldn't have said that. And that's a social thing. I'm possibly a class thing. I'm a working class man. Um, and what do we do as working class men? We go out and we provide and we come back and, and that's it. Uh, a lot of the men I talked to, what they said was, there's something missing. And, and there is something missing. There's something missing inside here. But there's also something missing in the narratives around society and uh, within policy. But there is a change and events like this, um, Beaker, counselling are all coming more and more on board to accepting men's feelings are valuable and can be validated and their actions can. So you're not alone and there is places to go and people to talk to about how you feel about not becoming a dad or on your journey to trying to become a dad. And next you're going to hear from Jack Broadley. Jack explains a bit about his background and his reasons for setting up the charity Baggy Trousers. Here he is. I was 21 when I was diagnosed and, you know, it's not, it's not something that you want to hear as a 21 year old, you've got testicular cancer. Um, and straight away after that, I was kind of shipped into a, into St. Mary's to go and bank my sperm. And, you know, in the back of the mind, you've got all these things going on, these emotional and, and psychological issues uh, of a diagnosis and then you're expected to produce sperm um, and it's very difficult to produce sperm when when you know you, those two testicles that you've got there one of them is going to be going um, but yeah I set up the charity about six months after I would finished all my treatment um, I just felt there wasn't enough support out there for men specifically um, I just felt there wasn't enough awareness out there there wasn't enough information in schools that was targeted towards young men um, and yeah, I, I just, you know, I thought it would be a great thing to do. Um, we're five years down the line now and, and how things have changed uh, night and day, really. Um, the support side of things, just touching on what Robin was saying, um, being in a room with other guys who've all experienced testicular cancer, different levels, but they've all experienced testicular cancer. Um, they don't want to open up about you know, what, what, what the future holds um, and kind of being the breaker of that chain and saying, look, you know, this is my experience. I've had testicular cancer. Um, I've banked a few sperm, well, albeit, you know, there's only a few there, um, but I've got some options. And as a result of hypogonadism, I'm not able to naturally conceive a child. So I'm heavy, heavily reliant on IVF treatment. And just having that conversation in a room with guys, it opened up the conversation. We themed it around um, becoming a father and fertility. Um, and there was probably about nine guys in the room. And there was a few that, you know, they, they'd, they'd had IVF treatment, so they'd had children. There were a few that were trying to have children after they'd finished the treatment. And then there was a few that wasn't really bothered and, you know, still quite young and not really thinking about it. Um, but it was nice to have that mix in, in the room. And there was one gentleman in particular um, who found it quite difficult to open up and, and talk about it, as you explained. Um, and he said him and his partner had been trying for quite some time now after they finished the treatment. And they were kind of getting to the end of the tether. Um, and he'd never really spoken to anybody about it other than his partner. And then he, he looked like he was quite stressed about it and you know, there's a big element of stress when it comes to trying to conceive a child. And two months later, in another session, a peer support group session, uh, he came to us at the very end, literally the last five minutes, and said, I've got some news. Uh, I'm, I'm going to become a dad. Um, and I, I, there's no way for me to prove it, but uh, I believe that you know, just holding that stress and then speaking about it, like you said, and, and getting it out there and, and then hearing it back and communicating with other guys about how you're feeling has removed that and you're able to just focus on the task. Um, and then obviously there's the factors of the diet and 
and the nutritional side. But yeah, you know, that, that in a nutshell is, excuse the pun, is um, a lot of the work that we do is around trying to just get guys to have a conversation. Um, and like you said before, Michael, men don't like to talk. Um, men are emotionally constipated. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my input on that. Right, we then start to discuss oxidative stress and we're back with Dr. Michael Carroll. Well, first off, what is oxidative stress? This stress and oxidative stress are two different things. We talk about oxidative stress. Stress, other stress is related to cortisol and adrenal gland and how to adapt to stressful situations. Oxidative stress is a, is a biochemical reaction that occurs naturally in the body and it's a way of balancing what's known as free radicals, um, which are a product of metabolism or a product of just cell death or cell aging. And they fly through the body and they cause all sorts of damage. They can damage the cell membrane, damage the DNA, and as a result, um, damage the cell, the cell quality of the cell. That includes sperm cells. So there's quite a strong link. Um, and, and also uh, causation. You can, you, can, you can do this in the lab. You can get sperm, put them in a little tube, and you can oxidatively stress them. And you can directly link the degree of oxidative stress and the degree of DNA damage. So there's a clear causation there. Does that happen um, in vivo, in the, in the body? It does, because you can see men who have um, conditions such as diabetes, they have increased levels of oxidative stress, they will have increased levels of DNA damage. And as a result, they are 30% uh, or roughly more infertile than non-diabetic males. Um, ultimately, that's what oxidative stress is. It's the balance between scavenging free radicals and um, the, the kind of production of free radicals. And if you get that balance right, you'll be healthy-ish. Now, what I say healthy issues because you need reactive oxygen species, free radicals, for the normal function of sperm. As sperm circumvent the female reproductive tract, they're exposed to these reactive oxygen species, and that's important for a, a, a process known as capacitation. They need that. So you can't just rid yourself of oxidative um, or of free radicals. They're a, part of, they're a part of a system called a homeostasis. So it's really important to have that. Again, it's all, in all aspects, aspects of health, it's a balance. It's the, the phenomenon of Gaia. It's like the earth, etc. cetera. I think you like. So I suppose how nutritionally can you help improve oxidative stress? Well, the um, present giver to the oxidative stress is the antioxidant. So when you kind of see on your blueberries, antioxidants, brilliant, and you're like, sounds great to me no idea what they do that is essentially the gift giver to the free radical um where do you get these gift givers from well really high in lots of different colored fruits and vegetables surprise surprise um so yeah that's kind of one of the places to start one of the things nutritionally that can also lead to oxidative stress are things like pesticides herbicides and this is where things like the organic argument kind of comes into it um so yeah kind of moving more towards eating organic is one of the benefits of reducing some of that oxidative stress what are the other things the other things would be um infections if you have a cold or if you have a flu or if you have um or injury in testicular injury that can increase oxidative stress because you have an infiltration of white blood cells and they some of the white blood cells will use oxidative stress to to kill foreign bodies like bacteria and stuff so again it's part of the normal process but if you shift that balance between an increase in free radicals and a decrease in scavengers, that's where the, the, the damage starts. Do you have anything to add? Sorry. Um, so in terms of the infections, I suppose what I see in my clinic, because I often see people who've gone down the conventional route and um, want to also go down the complementary route. And the sorts of infections I would see are often gut infections. So things like candida overgrowth, um, uh, things like a bad bacterial over overgrowth, things like SIBO are also infections that can cause oxidative stress, but aren't necessarily picked up by conventional medicine, but are probably important to mention. No, 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 it's always, it's always their partners who give me a call. Yeah, I know. It's like, yeah, that was me <laughs> once upon a time. Um, yeah, it's, it's usually their partners who will give me a call and say, uh, can you help me either with myself and also my partner? Usually if their partner is on board, they'll do it together. So I think it, I've once had a male call me up for support with this sperm but it's usually their partner but i'd love more men to call me up that want to help with this sperm 
Okay, so another question from the webinar was, what did Rosie think of Condensil? So what do I think of Condensil, which is a brand of sperm improvement supplement. So it's got things like, if I remember rightly, zinc, L-arginine. It's got cactus in it, I think, randomly. Um, is like one of the main proponents of it. And B vitamins. It has got bulking agents in it. And it is very expensive. So personally, I would say pretty much replicate that to a certain extent. And well, first, diet first, always, always, always. But once you've done that, get a good quality B vitamin, um, get a good quality zinc, um, get yeah, a good quality antioxidant. So brands, if people want brands, off the top of my head, Seeking Health, which is an American brand, is kind of my favorite kind of go-to brand, really healthy. Uh, by yeah Mark Hyman who's brilliant no binders no fillers no excipients in there um, other ones would be uh, Nutri Advance are nice they do some nice ones um, together they've got a nice B complex so yeah there's some I can add them after though can't I yeah probably easier just to send a link with I have a different take on this slightly because I think the fundamental flawed system we we want everything to be generic it's a very individualized story fertility is a very very individualized story it's an individualized couple at that point and then that couple if i hope not but if partners change the story changes so story is for the couple very individualized so my advice will be that see a nutritionist look at what you're having actually because no, none, no two of us are the same. We don't eat the same food. Even we think within the same house. We don't eat. We like certain things more than the others. And we do not know the actual nutritional value. So you need to see somebody, Dr. Felicity, Rosie, somebody. It's like you see a clinician. You see somebody to come. You want to have the test. You need to have the test done for oxidative stress. You can't just assume sitting somewhere and they say, we'll have condensal, we'll have this, and it'll improve. It doesn't work like this. And that is, I think, the fundamental flaw of our, because we're becoming so generic, it's very individualized. I'm going back to see Jack's story about testicular cancer. It, you know, 1% of men have, will have no sperm. And out of those 1% of men will have no sperm, 1% will have testicular cancer. So how many men have been followed up who had no sperm for testicular cancer in the country? Not really, you know. So we're just hoping, same as low sperm count, very low sperm count. Yes, we've given them all these medications, but are they followed off testicular cancer for their lifetime? Not really. So the story doesn't finish. Story is very individualized. And again, please come meet people. Come to, you know, see, Robin, come to these meetings because we're not here. We still, I'm impressed with this. Very impressive audience, very good for, for them to come actually, to be here. But most of us are we just sitting silently and think, oh, can we have this tablet? My partner will give it to me and we'll just be okay. And I think that's where we are at this moment of time. I think we need to come up and say, there's a problem. We need to deal with it. And we need to seek the right person. And maybe Rosie is the right, the right person to seek rather than, yeah. be, be, ra, be, because, because rather than just going and saying, buying something on a shelf, you go and see, yeah. this is what the issue is. You don't go to see a doctor and say, oh, I have a problem. Can you sort me out? He will say, I'll do this investigation, I'll do this test, and I'll find out what the problem is. You know, and you need to see the right person for the right thing. And I'm glad you said that, because I feel like I can't say, you've just got to come and see me. That's, but, but, yeah, you've, yeah, that in, yeah, it is completely individual. Um, yeah, it's, it is, you need that individual advice. And often what clients say to me is, although I've paid to go and see a nutritional therapist, I'm actually saving on the amount of rattling supplements that I was taking before that I didn't actually really need to be on. I just read it on a forum or, or a blog. So I can save you money. <laughs> we then had an audience question about where do you start if you're just starting out on your journey to conceive? And we're going to hear first from Dr. Mohammed. In the first thing, okay, when you want to try, I think you need to see a clinician. That's what the way you can try a test at home. There is some test available. If you really want to see that, 
that is correct. You can do that. For example, women, if their periods are regular, they're probably 90% ovulating. So they know kind of, you don't need an ovulation test to prove that. You don't need a, your reproductive health app on your iPhone or Samsung Galaxy S10. To, yes. And then and this sperm, and that's, and for to the men, sperm tests are available at home. But ideally, currently in the UK, we want a UKS system. So we want an IVF lab to do a semen test because it'll give you the idea. But if you want to do a home test, yes, it is at least a start. But you need to see somebody and probably the sooner the better because the, to have a child is two to tango. So, you know, you need to have both. So you need to have the story male and female both to do it from there. And, and that's, I think, the beginning to start with. And once you've seen that and then you said you've identified an issue, then yes, nutritionalist. And then yes, psychological support. It's very important. Or if you're finding it difficult to begin with, you have an underlying issue to begin with, then maybe you can start from the back. You can start from the psychological support, seeing the nutritionist, and you, because you can identify yourself if you have an underlying medical condition. If you're not, and you're not sure, then either you can do to begin with a home test or ideally see somebody in a fertility unit where actually you can have the appropriate test and the appropriate. I'll see what. Just to add to, to your question as well, when do you um, seek advice? Um, according to the World Health Organization, it's, it's 12 months of trying. And if you haven't had a, a successful pregnancy after 12 months, then you seek something. So a lot of people don't realize that. So they could be trying for five years, six years, but then they're five or four or five years outside the recommended window of, not, of, um, of investiga where investigation should take place. So it's 12 months. If you try and reg regular sex twice a week or more, if you can. Um, I've got a lot of violence on now, so that's taken up a lot of people's time. Um, or that might be adding, who knows. Um, the point is, regular sex for a year, if you haven't fallen pregnant by that time, then, then there's an indication. That's the first step. That's where the investigation should start. And I sometimes say when people call me and because I suppose that I'm, I'm starting to get a new swathe of people, which is quite exciting for me, who haven't even started trying yet, but they kind of want to get those MOT style things done, including a sperm test, which I think is really fantastic. Like you've not even started trying. Why not go and get a sperm test? Why wait that 12 months? Um, and I suppose the reason for me, I, in terms of my job, that I think it's great to not wait is when I often get people who come to me who they've been trying years, they're frustrated, they're pissed off, they're angry, they're upset. They're at that kind of point of desperation. Um, whereas you can make those lifestyle changes and there's no reason you can't go for investigations. Okay, you'll need to pay for it. And a sperm test at, say, Manchester Fertility is 125 quid, which might be a good investment. Uh, yeah. So one quick one to add to Michael's point of 12 months. The statistical number, if you have been trying for 12 months with unprotected sexual intercourse, I will not say the number of how, how much you have to have, there's an 84% chance statistically to have a baby that year. That's what, according to the NICE fertility guidelines. So then you were left with 16%. So that's how they've come up to. And because of this 84% chance, that is why the CCGO doesn't fund for single women or same-sex women. And they want to have six cycles of insemination because this, each cycle is 14% per cycle. That's multiplied to an 84% chance. So that's how they come up with this number. Right, we go back to the webinar again. Really interesting question about whether clinics are doing enough to test the sperm when there has been a case of recurrent miscarriage. So there was a systematic review uh, published by Birmingham about three years ago, which showed the sperm DNA fragmentation is associated with high risk of miscarriage. And since then, it's been there. So currently, the, the DNA fragmentation is the amount of DNA which is fragments on the top of the sperm DNA head and is associated with miscarriage. Now, the trouble with the, this test is DNA fragmentation is because once you do the test, that semen sample or sperm test is not value, valid anymore. You need to produce another sample to actually do the treatment. So that is one of the drawback of the test. So you can do the DNA fragmentation test, but that sample is not now can be used. So now you need to do another test. And then you presume then the other test or the semen sample will be equivalent to this. And unfortunately, not every semen sample is exactly the same. 
because by the time you come three months later, it's entirely different. So that is one of the drawbacks. So that is, but there's a link with association with miscarriages. And the difficulty with that is that we do not have a known modality to improve it. We do not know what to do. So we found high DNA fragmentation. There's a risk of miscarriage. What should we do? Uh, okay, diet, improve this. But then you do another test. And if it is okay, will it cause it? Very difficult to pinpoint. And one of the issues which is started from, it's, it's come from the United States, and that is for genetic screening of the embryo to find cause for miscarriages. And we always assume that when we do screen the embryo, the outer part, which is the afterbirth, and we screen the embryo, and the embryo will represent exactly the same as the embryo, of the outer part of the afterbirth will represent exactly what the embryo is. Because you can't take a sample from the embryo because it'll be missing part of the embryo. So there was, there's a data published again a year ago in which about 50 odd women gave their embryos, donated their embryos and tested for genetic abnormalities. And 45% of them did not represent the same genetic problem which was we found in the afterbirth and in the embryo. So at the minute, we are far away from the reality that we have a robust test enough to actually genetically test the embryo right now. We are not there yet. However, in next few years, couple of years, yes, we might be doing it. And one of the things I'm going to ask that to Michael, because I have asked them about a couple of years ago, the same question, that we should have a test in Manchester, which in which we do the half of the semen sample for DNA fragmentation, but we use the same sample. And that's the difficulty at this moment of time, because then we know what is this sample doing for this time. Have we, have we read there anymore? We don't, but there could be an option though. If, if, you, um, if you have a sample that has high DNA damage, and then you do a lifestyle change that you're being, or change in nutrition, you come back and you, do, you provide the sample. You don't use the whole sample for a DNA damage test. You only, you only need about half a million cells. You do that, it's called a comet assay. So that as, the, as you run the sperm head through a gel, the degree of DNA damage will tail off like a comet. Bigger the tail, higher the damage. So what you can do is if you can preserve the sample, freeze the sample, you've done the DNA damage test, you can say, well, this sample has X percentage of DNA damage, but you've frozen it down. But then the other conundrum is, does freezing cause DNA damage? Well, it doesn't really, not, they're not in our hands anyway. So, but there are options that you can do where you can test the sample, freeze it, and then use that for um, insemination later on. So in my experience, in my experience, sorry, we're gonna we're gonna play this game. So in my experience, what I've seen most of this this comet or tunnel assays, the DNA fragmentation test has come back, that the sample is suitable for IVF, and it only tells us to ICSI. That's what I've seen most of the time that you do actually take the put the sperm directly into the egg. Uh, but other than that, until unless the clinic has not support of a nutritionalist or somebody providing that, it is find it hard to actually change the course. Can you see? So, so yes, we do the test, but then out of the test, we need to again come back to nutritional value. Or lifestyle changes. Or lifestyle changes. All right, so before we finish with our brilliant panel, I had asked them all to share one final piece of wisdom. Uh, top, my last top tip that I don't think we've mentioned, me and Michael talking about it before, is plastic um, and how endocrine disrupting it is. Um, and in actual fact, I mean, we know it's killing the ocean. And like Michael was saying, turning male fish into females in some case, yeah, not all of them <laughs> in some cases, um, which I mean, I, that's mental for me. Like, and I think sometimes do we need, and although there are trials and evidence say it does affect fertility, sometimes I don't think we even need double blind clinical trials. Like it's ruining the bloody planet and it is also ruining our sperm. So try and reduce plastics, get a little metal bottle, don't heat things up in plastic, it releases it. I suppose my um, words of wisdom would be on the back of about 30% of, of uh, infertile couples or male infertility is caused by idiopathic infertility. We don't know basically. So what I would say in a big red sign is keep calm and have more sex because that's how you get the sperm to the egg. You have to get them swimmers right up that vagina into the uterus to the egg. Keep calm, have more sex. And if you don't succeed after a year, well then look into it. Then I'm just gonna follow it on, then seek help and do not worry. And do not worry, the help is available. And you know, the sooner you come, the better it is. And the younger 
you are, the better it is. We, uh, so we have in Manchester, we have about 10 years of data for surgical sperm retrieval. We're going to publish the data. And again, it is astonishing results when we'll publish it. It's as good as normal ejaculated sperm. So when men have no sperm, it's not the end of the world. It's just, you know, you just need to come early. And so please, 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 I'm going to say to most men who is listening or there, that come speak to us, speak to Robin, speak to Rosie, come somewhere. Please, it doesn't have to be me and speak to somebody because like, come on, because we are like, we, you know, come, you know, the key, don't, don't come anywhere, you know, or don't go anywhere else, you know. So, so, so the, key, the key is that you need to have, seek help. And if you have a medical illness or something uh, there, please again come early. I cannot say that. As you can see, we all got a bit childish with Dr. Mohammed asking uh, men to come anywhere. Uh, we still need to hear from Robin and Jack. Fantastic. It's, it's okay to struggle. And it's okay to be broody. And it's okay to be, want to be a dad just because there's not a lot of information out there or narratives for you to draw on, then maybe you just have to create your own. I'd be a bit careful about being the rock in the relationship. Are you a rock or are you a volcano? And if you're a rock, are you by yourself? And how healthy is that for you? That may be going out and getting some support and looking at what your expectations are and sharing those can be really helpful. Yeah, just echoing what Robin's saying, really. Um, you know your own body better than anybody else. And if it's, you know, if it's telling you that something isn't right, then, yeah, it's worth going seeing a clinician. Um, and then the other side of it really is, you know, having those conversations. It's not, you might, you might deem it as embarrassing, but as soon as you open up to your best friend or, you know, you open up to, somebody that you go to the gym with or you go to the pub with and you have that conversation about, you know, sperm, ejaculating, sex, you'll soon realize that, you know, it's more comfortable than you think. And like, <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, just, just, just be open and, and just try and think of it in a, in a, in a relaxed manner and, and try not to get too worked up and stressed about it. And there you have it, our first Men Matters too. Talk Fertility event. That was the live recording. Apologies for the changing audio. We're working on it and next time it will be much clearer. Um, go and check out the show notes for this episode, which are Men Matter 2 live. And I'll put all the details of the guests that we had and also uh, a link to a page that you can join our mailing list so you can keep up to date with future events. Do check out the Talk Fertility Radio Show, which is on ukhealthradio.com. I'll be sharing clips of it in this podcast over the coming weeks. But for now, that's it from me. Thank you, as always, for your support. And until the next time, 